All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about big O notation, um, something we might have referenced before. Um, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're completely you know, new to that uh, concept, but don't worry, after today, hopefully you understand what big O notation refers to and kind of how to use it to analyze your code. All right, so I'm going to start my presentation here. Present. Um, all right, so co complexity analysis using big O notation. Now I'll say offhand, again, this isn't something that's vital um, for you to know, especially for our curriculum. But um, as I mentioned before, this is definitely a popular interview question as in um, they will at, typically ask you to analyze your code and give them some um, big O rating. Um, so again, it is very important to know this, especially when you get into interview season. Also as a developer, we've talked about, you know, step one is actually, let's kind of get into it. Um, so step one, uh, the goals of a software developer. Um, hopefully you guys remember this slide. I've definitely used it a couple of times. Um, it's not because I'm lazy. Well, I might be lazy, but also because this is basically very important. I want to stress this. So again, solving the problem is just part A. That is not, you know, you're not done after you solve, you know, your problem or complete your project. There's always um, ways you can improve your code. And to become a better software developer, I will encourage all of you guys to always be mindful and always strive to, you know, don't just settle for, hey, it works, I'm done always try to apply some of the things that we've talked about to improve your code and just improve yourself as a software developer. So we talked about structurally um, how to improve your code. So that such just things are, you know, adding comments, uh, creating classes and functions, creating separate files for your code. Also um, talking about, you know, creating proper architecture. So like if you're creating a large project, are you using a peer-to-peer -peer network or using a client server model? Again, these decisions impact um, structurally how your um, application or your project um, can be improved. Functionally, uh, we haven't really talked about that, sorry. Functionally, um, that's the idea of just what's your user experience. So when I, when I say structurally, I mean from a de developer side. So again, your user is not gonna really know if you've created classes behind the scene or if you're you know, using a database or just a CSV file, they're not gonna know or usually they won't care. Uh, so structurally, when you improve your, your design, it's for the developer and for maintainability of your code. When I talk about functionally, this is where we talk about what the user actually sees. So we, um, this, you know, uh, this is where the notion of better usability. And there's many things we could do to make your application more usable. Um, so just think about the user experience, the UI UX development, um, something I'm really interested in. Um, is your application easy to navigate? Is it easy to use? Intuitive? Um, you know, do does it make sense the way the layout is presented? Again, there's a whole whole a uh, lot of considerations in there. Like, do you use tooltips? Again, is it is it easy for a user to understand? Your application um, just the first time they're using it. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of ways your application functionally can become better. Um, but then we also talk about algorithmically. So this is actually just like the performance of your algorithm, or sorry, of your application. And that usually just breaks down into two main buckets. So um, algorithmically in Premiere code, um, execution speed. So how quickly does your application or your algorithm take to solve um, or produce results? Um, users will notice this. So like if you if you know if you're using Google and it takes like 20 seconds to get a search result, I mean users are probably not going to be happy about that. You're probably going to need to op optimize your search engine. There's also resource optimization. So the main one here is like memory usage. How much memory does your application use? Um, usually speaking, this isn't a huge consideration. As in, um, it's memory is pretty cheap. Um, it's easy to get more and more memory. Um, but speed again, it's it, you can't just buy time, right? So most of the time when we talk about um, making optimizations, it's usually refers to speed, but not always. Um, sometimes memory is a consideration, especially for like high memory intensive applications, like, um, you know, the latest modern games or creating like a, you know, a photo editor. Um, certain applications definitely use a lot of memory. In that case, you might need to optimize your memory usage. But again, for our needs, uh, most of the time, we're gonna be talking about speed optimizations. Um, so again, unfortunately, this lecture is not going to focus on what or kind of the strategy to apply optimizations. That is something that um, hopefully we'll tackle in a future lecture. But um, the focus of this lecture is actually how to identify what can be improved. So step one, figure out what we need to change. And then step two, which we're not going to cover today necessarily, is how to actually go about doing that. All right. So before you know how to improve the efficiency of your algorithm, you have to know how to analyze it. And that's what we're going to learn today. So this is where we get into big O notation. Now, kind of funny to say, um, doesn't really roll off the tongue, but what is big O notation? So big O notation is a way to represent the relative complexity of a given algorithm 
Um, so again, it's, it's relative. It's not an exact, exact measurement. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it, it describes the algorithm's performance based on the change in inputs versus the um, performance of the, or the time, time it takes to run. So again, it's all relative. So basically, if, you're, you know, if, if your input size doubles, how does the time, your, your application or algorithm, how, how long does that, or how, what's the change in time? Sorry, I'm kind of stumbling over my words. Um, so your change in input, how does that impact your time? Um, so example usage of big O notation, you might see something written like this. The way you would kind of uh, pronounce it would be this algorithm has big O of N um, time complexity and uh, big O of one memory complexity. Um, these also have particular names, so we'll kind of identify those. But just understand when you see notation like this, that's just referring to big O notation. So you just say big O of N, big O of one. Um, there's other uh, variations we'll see there. All right, so that's our um, introduction of big O notation. Um, there are other types of notation. So big O is the one you'll most commonly hear, but um, there are uh, at least two others, there might be more, um, but there's big theta and big omega. So big O refers to the worst case complexity. So when we say worst case, we're just saying, all right, let's just say hypothetically for whatever situation we have, um, it's gonna take the longest amount of time possible. That is the worst case your algorithm will, will, will deal with. That is what big O is actually kind of measuring or referencing. Um, big theta is also kind of important to developers. Um, so, you know, you might have an algorithm that might have a terrible worst case, but your average case, as in your typical inputs, your typical outputs, that average case is going to have maybe a, a totally different um, um, time complexity to it. Not typical, but sometimes it is possible that you have a terrible big O, but you have a, a manageable big theta. Um, again, so this is sometimes considered, I, I don't, I really haven't come across big theta. Um, uh, typically they'll ask you big O, because again, that is, again, you want to know what the worst, th worst performance your algorithm will have. But average case definitely matters. Um, you usually won't hear about big omega, because best case doesn't really, it's not, again, it's not really useful. Um, for me, it's not really useful to know, all right, in the best circumstance, like if hypothetically all the cards align or all the stars align, um, you know, how quickly will my algorithm perform? Again, that's, that's not really useful to developers, but it does exist. I'm sure it is relevant in some contexts, but um, just know that it exists, but you won't see it very often. All right, so we're gonna be focusing on big O um, throughout this discussion though. Um, so, so there's various time complexities. Um, the list here is not exhaustive, meaning there are definitely other types um, of complexities. Again, you can kind of combine all these together uh, depending on your algorithm, um, how it is structured. But um, these are the main ones you'll kind of come across. So we'll start with big O of one. This is also known as constant time. Um, and then we all go, go all the way down to exponential time. Um, so the further you go down, the slower and slower your application goes. So you want your time to be minimized, obviously. So again, when your, um, I guess your formula here, or I'm not sure what to refer to this as, but when your, your value here gets larger, as in you know, N squared is obviously gonna produce larger results in N. That just means you're gonna be taking more and more time for your algorithm to execute as the size of inputs grow. All right, so in this case, the lower number is best because we wanna minimize time. All right, so let's look at some of these in detail. Um, I wanna bring up a coding window. So where did that go? Um, CDs, CDs. I should have had this up earlier, but. All right, so my window came up here. Let's pull that over here and open it. All right, so we're gonna create a new file. Let's just call that big O.py. And we're gonna look at some examples. So first, we're gonna talk about constant time. So, the, sorry, have the slides. Constant time. So execution, this, this just means that execution speed does not change at all based on input size. So no matter what happens to your input, your whatever particular algorithm or part of your, your application, so this is necessarily referred to your entire application. It could be parts of your application. Um, that just means that the task at hand, it's not gonna take any longer or it's not gonna be any shorter. Um, regardless of the input size. So, you know, let's say we have an array that's, you know, has two items in it or a million items in it. 
if we have an O of one or a constant time complexity operation, that just means it's gonna take the same amount of time no matter what the input is. Um, one simple example to think of is appending an item to a list. So we take a look at that. Um, let me go back to my coding window. All right, so pretty simple example here, but I just wanna convey the idea. So in here, we have a function called append to list. So if I create a list, uh, let's just create a list up here. Let me make that a larger. Um, so let's create a list. My list is going to be equal to, you name this, let's call this data. All right, my list is going to be just a series of numbers. Let's go one, four, eight, I don't know, some just random numbers, All right? So this list has six items in it. If we want to append a new list, we could use this function. Obviously, there's other methods that exist already. But if I call my myList.append, let's say we want to add the number of 77, right? Append to list. Let's call it into data. All right, so again, this method, um, so we want to analyze the complexity of this method. We would look at it and basically understand what's going on here. So um, this is an example of constant time, meaning data, the size of data does not matter. Again, we might have a million items here, but appending, simply tacking on a value here is a constant time operation, right? It, it does not have to iterate through every item to know kind of where to insert. Um, lists kind of keep track of the insertion point. So again, if we're appending something, uh, we could have you know two items, we could have a million items. This is gonna take the same amount of time regardless. And that's the whole idea of constant time. The size of your input does not change your, the time or the time execution of your operation. And this is a very simple example, but um, hopefully it conveys it, the idea. All right, so that's constant time. Um, other examples of constant time operations, again, if we're talking about lists, um, looking up items in lists. So if I do my list, and this gets more into data structures, which we're gonna cover tomorrow, but looking up something, like if I want index four, this is a constant time operation. So since lists have indices, this automatically has access to this value. We don't have to go from here to here to here to here to here. Um, that is not how lists work in Python. Um, there are things, there's a data structure known as linked lists. Again, we'll cover this more tomorrow, so if you're unfamiliar with it, but the idea of linked lists is that you don't have indices that can refer to objects. You actually had to trans traverse your data to get to the item you want. So if you actually want to get to the fifth item, for linked lists, you had to go one by one. And so lookups in linked lists are not O of N, but lookup times, in lists in Python, also known as arrays in JavaScript, they are constant time operations. Okay, so that's the idea of constant time. Um, hopefully that pretty make, makes much sense. All right, next up we have logarithmic time complexity. Um, execution speed grows logarithmically, or I'd say slowly based on input size. So a common complexity for divide and conquer al algorithms. Um, again, you guys coded up binary search a couple days ago. So hopefully you guys are familiar with the idea of binary search, what it's doing. Um, and this again is a more efficient algorithm than linear search, which we'll, we'll talk about also. Again, binary search, the idea is just breaking your, your larger input into smaller sections, into twos, and you can kind of just keep dividing by two um, to reduce your search space. Um, I have another example of, oh, oops, sorry, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to binary search, but just know that binary search is log event. All right, logarithmic time. Uh, next up, we have linear time complexity. Um, this one is pretty easy to understand in terms of execution speed grows linear, linearly. Sorry, words are tough. Uh, basically, proportionally based on input size. So for linear time complexity, that means uh, your algorithm, if your input size doubles, your time will also double. Again, it's all relative. So linear search is you know, a pretty simple example of it. Um, I have another example that we can look at. Um, so let's get rid of this. Let's drop in linear time example. So here, let me just get rid of this. We don't need it anymore. Um, find item greater. So what this is doing, um, my function here, the goal of this function is to take in data, which is gonna be a list. And we're going to see if any value or any item inside of that um, list, it exceeds the value that we specify. So what I mean by that is, let's say we put, pass in, um, find item greater, we pass in my list from above, and then we want to see if any value exceeds, let's say 12. All right, so we're gonna 
basically check every item in order in my list. That's what enumerate's doing here. We mean the index for, and the value, which is X. We're gonna check if the X, the value we encounter is greater than the value we specified, which is our target value. Let's make that more clear. Target value, right? So we just wanna see if any item inside this list exceeds our target value. If it does, we wanna return the index of it, the first item. Otherwise, we turn negative one. Maybe we just return true or false. I don't think it matters. All right, so this function will return true if any single item is greater than our target value. Otherwise, if none, no item is greater than a target value, return false. Now, this is linear time complexity because we, like, we put, again, when we talk about big O, it's worst case. Potentially, we need to go through every single item in our list um, before we have an answer ready for us. All right, we'll clean this up. Okay, so again, oh, um, big O notation is worst case. We're not talking about best case. Obviously, if I just had you know any value greater than zero, the best case in this case is the first item is the item that we want. So you might think, hey, that's constant time. But again, that's in the best of circumstances, which we don't really usually care about. We wanna know in the worst, absolute worst case, how many iterations might it take? So we have like 99 as our target value. Obviously, we're gonna check the first value, then the second, so forth. We're gonna go through our entire list, which is gonna be, Seven, you know, seven checks, seven items, seven iterations. Sorry, that was meant to be a comment. All right, so we have seven items. We might have to do up to seven iterations before we complete this this algorithm, right? But I'm sure you guys will agree, and hopefully you agree. If I have like 89, 90, you know, if I add more items, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be sorted. But if I add more items, well, now that I have you know, 10 items, it's gonna take 10 iterations. So each iteration is gonna have a time cost to it. So in that, that case, you, you can clearly see as we add items, our iterations or basically our time execution um, is going up proportionally. So if you have a hundred items, that's gonna be a hundred iterations. All right, so that's another example of linear, um, linear time or O of N uh, complexity. All right, let's keep going down our big O track. So there's also log. Hey, I got a question real quick. Yep. Um, so just for my understanding, that log N algorithm, the reason that that's more efficient than a linear is because rather than seven items, seven iterations, like in the example of the binary search, it's going to be reducing how many possible iterations you would have. Yeah, so again, uh, I know this kind of goes back to like, you know, high school math, and I, I definitely forget most of high school math, but yeah, log n, if you remember the curve of it, um, larger numbers don't, um, like the curve of it kind of flattens out as we go. We'll, we'll see a graph shortly. I think on our curriculum page, actually, if we have that up, uh, I guess we don't have that up, but yeah, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> uh, we'll go over that. But yeah, log n, just the growth rate is much slower than a linear uh, growth rate. So for, if we're talking about, you know, log n, basically, if we go to 100, we might have like 10 iterations for a log n operation. When we get to 1,000, we might just have 20. So again, as this grows, like, you know, by tenfold, this doesn't necessarily go tenfold. It's slower than the, da the data input. But yeah, uh, good question. We'll, we'll definitely cover um, some comparisons there. Okay, there's also log linear. Um, merge sort is an example of it. Again, this is just quicker or more quickly than linear. Um, so it's going to have a faster gro growth rate than O of n. Um, again, merge sort, you guys can look that up, but um, merge sort is one example of log linear time complexity. Moving on, uh, quadratic time complexity. So this is execution speed grows quadratically or very quickly based on input size. Um, so one example is finding duplicate values in a list. Let's, let's take a look at that and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. So I'm gonna throw that uh, code up here and we'll talk about it. All right, so this is an example of quadratic time complexity, or also known as big O of n squared. Um, so let's say find double. Um, find double my lists, and that's all we need. All right, so the goal of this function is to take in an input. So let me I change, change this to data. I don't know why I always have my list here. Data, you can name this whatever you want, in the donuts if you want to, but I'm going to call it data. So the goal of this is to take an input of data, which is going to be a list of numeric values, um, iterate through it, and just basically see if any value exists that's double any other value. So in this case, if we are starting with one, we want to see if we have anything that's double the value of one. So in that case, if we find a two, great, we're done. 
let's say that two doesn't exist. Let's say we have a three. Um, but anyway, the goal again is to find any item in here that's double the current value. And the current value can be any of these. So we start by looping um, in our outer loop through each item. So we're going to start with one, then we're going to move on to four, then eight um, in our outer loop here. But we also have an inner loop. And the reason we have an inner loop is because we don't need to search every, everyone else, essentially, to see if anything is doubled. So right, we start with a one. So let's say we put a one here. Then this loop is going to go start with one, which obviously you could probably avoid and optimize out. So we need to check the same value. Um, but we can go through all the values here. All right, so we can go through this entire list. All right, that's what the inner loop is doing for each iteration of here. And so we do a comparison. Um, a comparison is not going to add any time complexity. An if statement is just one operation um, all the time. So this doesn't add any time complexity. <clears throat> so essentially what we're going to do, again, on the worst case, we need to go through this entire list um, out here, right? We're going to go one, four, eight, all the way to the last item, which is five. Um, and the inner loop may, will be going through that list each time, again, in the worst case scenario. So in the worst case, meaning a double does not exist, We'll have to go through this once in the outer loop. And then for each outer loop iteration, the inner loop will go through the list entirely. So this adds a factor of n, <clears throat> where again, n is the, kind of the length of this array. And then internally, we also have another factor of n. Since these are nested, this is where we get n times n. So n for the outer loop, and then n for the inner loop. But the reason we multiply it, to be clear, is because they are nested. So that gives us n times n, also known as n squared. So that's why we get O of n squared here. So again, analyzing code uh, gets, it takes some familiarity. Just know, for the most part, anytime you see nested for loops iterating over the same data, that's going to be n squared complexity. This is different. So if I had another algorithm, I'm not sure what it's going to do. But if I just had something here, if you have like a for loop that goes through data, <clears throat> for x and data, let's just print out some stuff. And let's say we had a separate for loop, that was for y and data. Um, I don't know what we want to do here, print negative x. In this case, we do have two for loops. So this adds a factor of n, because again, if your input size is a million, we're going to do uh, potentially a million iterations here. So that's a factor of n. And then this for loop is also a factor of n, because we're going through the entire, entire loop. But in this case, this for loop has nothing to do with this for loop. <clears throat> I mean, yes, I mean, this, the second for loop has to wait for um, <clears throat> the first for loop to complete. But this is, they're not nested or they're not kind of doing work in combination. So in this case, let me move my comment up here. In this case, this is not, not O of uh, <clears throat> N squared. In this example, we actually get something that essentially is O of 2n. Oops, sorry. O of 2n. But the way um, big O analysis works is that you kind of drop constants. So even though this is going to take like 2n times, this still is O of n. And now that might be a little confusing, but the idea here is that we don't care about the, like this factor, sure, will make your algorithm long, longer than something that is strictly O of N. But we, we care about relative performance, not actual time performance. So in this case, yes, you know these are 2N, but we drop the constant off here. So this constant kind of magically goes away. So this is still O of N, even though we have two separate for loops. And these are, you know, we're adding two Ns together. So that's N plus N, which becomes O of N, 2N, which again boils down to O of N. Because again, we care about relative performance based on input size. We don't care about the actual measurement of time. All right, so there's no separate for loops. That's not n squared. Any questions about n squared complexity or everything I just said? Um, and I know I can't see the slide, but O of n, that would just be linear then. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, so O of n is linear. Then we have log linear, which is kind of between quadratic and linear. And then um, quadratic is worse than log linear. So we're going in from the best complexity, which is constant. Let's do a reminder. Constant is the best. So if your algorithm is constant time complexity, great. Um, that's the best case scenario. Um, logarithmic, that's not too bad. Again, uh, it's not going to be 
too terrible, uh, despite your, uh, your input size becoming larger and larger. Um, it's still going to take some extra amount of time, but not you know not that much extra time. Uh, linear time again is proportional. Log linear is quickly. Uh, quadratic is just very quickly. As in, if your input size doubles, your time complexity is going to quadruple. All right. Next up, we have exponential time complexity. This is ridiculously quickly, or also just terrible. Um, terrible time efficiency. For the most part, if you write an algorithm or an application that has exponential time complexity, that's a bad idea. It's not going to perform well with large inputs. Uh, one great example is Fibonacci. Um, this, is some, this is another uh, challenge that you guys coded up. Um, so the Fibonacci sequence um, is an example of exponential time complexity. Um, if you want to see that at play, let's actually revisit our old friend Fibonacci. So we're going to go back here, get rid of our list. All right, so I've coded up the Fibonacci sequence. Hopefully you guys are comfortable with this. Um, got some typos there. Um, so Fibonacci is, this is recursively. So basically we are going to call our function again uh, to get to return value. And then let's actually print some data out here. So let's say our n value is going to be um, let's start with a small number. So let's go with n equals four. And if you remember what our Fibonacci sequence is, it's zero, zero, one, what is it? One, two, three, five. Sorry, I'm trying to do all my math here. All right, so if we want, let's do n equals six. So we do one, two, three, four, five, six. We should get three back. Let's test this out. So print, let's go f equals Fibonacci of n, where n is six. And then we want to print out, let's just print out the result for now. All right, so I'm going to bring up my terminal. I'm going to run Python big O. OK, so I've put this up incorrectly. That should be, oh, that should be a plus one. So this should be n minus one, n minus one, n minus two. Sorry. Hopefully you guys remember Fibonacci better than I do, but we want to get the last two values here. So from that, okay, notice we had eight. So I off by a factor, zero, one, two, three, four. Five. You have to get rid of uh, one zero in there in your example. Gotcha. So one, two, three, four, five, six, I guess it's five. Um, all right. Um, so n equals six, I guess, gets the seventh item. Um, is that right? So n equals zero. zero. Okay, so I guess we start at zero base. I guess that's, that's what's coming out. So this is index zero, one, two, or item zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, back on track here. So n equals six, she gets eight. Um, that's what we do get. Um, all right, cool. You know, that, that seems to work pretty fine. Didn't take too much time. Let's investigate the number of calls we're doing here. So I've created a global variable called calls. I'm access, accessing that inside my Fibonacci function and incrementing that each time. The reason I have a global variable is because we are using recursion. So it's a little harder to keep track of a value um, through recursion. So I just decided to create a global variable. Um, some syntax maybe you've not seen before. I'm using this global keyword. If I did not have this in here, um, this would create a new variable called calls and increment that locally. As in this would be a local variable for each, each Fibonacci call that happens that's going to have an individual local variable called calls. But I don't want that. I want to keep an aggregate counter. So I'm going to use global calls. And this is going to say, hey, get this value or this variable from the global context, which is calls out here. All right. So this, hopefully you guys can understand what that's achieving. OK, so let's actually see how our calls are doing. So I'm going to print out the value of calls. So print f, let's say f. And then the number of calls we have. So let's print everything out just for good measure. So we're going to print n, the value of n is our input, n equals n. And then I want to print out the number of calls we are making. So this is the number of times we actually call the Fibonacci function. Again, keep in mind that this is happening recursively. So um, we're going to get more and more calls. All right, so n is our input, f is our Fibonacci value, c is going to be our number of calls. So let's run this again with the same input of six. Clear that, Python, big O. All 
All right, so notice our n equals six, our Fibonacci value is eight. Number of calls we made is 15. All right, not too many, you know, definitely return really quickly. Um, let's see what happens if we double our input. So I'm gonna double this from six to 12. All right, let's see what actually happens to our input here. So I'm gonna go Python, let's clear this. Now let's run it. All right, so for n equals 12, our Fibonacci value is 144. You guys can fact check that, hopefully that's correct. Um, I think my algorithm's correct up here. Anyway, uh, notice number of calls. So our input size doubled, right? Six to 12, but our calls didn't simply double, right? We don't have 30 calls here. We have nearly 300 calls here, 287 to be exact. So a doubling of our input exponentially grew our calls. So if you wanna see this um, further off, let's, um, let's go to 18. So we're not you know, doubling this again, but we're just kind of skipping six again. So again, now we're in the 5,000s for n equals 18. So, so we've tripled, right? We started with a six, now we've tripled our value, but our calls have just kind of gone through the roof, right? We're in the thousands now. What if we went for n equals 24? Again, exponential time is terrible. So this takes 90,000, over 90,000 calls. Now I'm, I'm gonna kind of spoil it here. We're, we're not gonna, be able to go much further because this number is growing ridiculously fast. So I run it on 30. It'll let me. Okay, notice there's a pause there. It, it actually took like a human readable amount of time. Like all of these seem to come back like within milliseconds. This took like a, a decent second to compute. This was what over 1.6 million calls just for a value of 30. All right. What if we go to I'm not going to go too crazy. So let's go let's do 32. Okay, I just in increased by a smidge. Um, so we were at 1.6 million before. Uh, notice we're, we're waiting a long time there. We're at 4.3 million for just going up a value of two. So last value I'm gonna try, I don't know if, I don't know if this, will, this will complete, 36. Let's give it a try. All right, we're waiting, we're waiting. Um, yeah, it, it's taking a lot of time. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if, okay, it came back. So that took maybe like 10 seconds. Uh, this is 300 million calls in it, or no, 20, 29 million calls, almost 30 million calls for any hey, consensus. Anker, yep. uh, on this, I, I remember like when we would start doing our infinite loops, um, Python, uh, VS Code would return like, hey, you've recursively called a function 900 times. Um, we're gonna stop. Why doesn't this stop? Like, how does the computer know hey, we're going to eventually return something here. Yeah, that's a great question. I believe, so don't quote me on it. I think that that message that you guys ran into, perhaps, would, was because your output, as in if you output too much, it'll cut you off. But maybe that's not true. Um, was that I, in VS Code or specifically REPL? No, I've seen it in Python where okay. it says maximum recursion depth, I think, exceeded. Um, I think that's for an infinite loop. So again, we're not infinite looping. Like we're at, yeah. 30 million, but our computer is able to handle that. As in we have enough memory to create all those call stacks um, that it's not freaking out. But yeah, if we had an infinite call stack, let's actually just do an infinite. I mean, we had one before, but let's do a for while true. I think this is the message you're talking about. So again, yes, infinite Python will cut you off at some point, but infinite is not the same as 30 million, right? 30 million is a large number. Um, let's print out I. Let's see how far we get with our eyes. All right, so the initial 10 seconds is compute, you know, our Fibonacci, or with more than 10 seconds, I don't know how long it takes. And then it's going to start printing out uh, this stuff. Oops. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry. I just want to show this error. But yeah, again, this isn't infinite. We do have enough space. At some point, there is probably some upper limit. So if I went to like n equals 40, it might not return. Python might be good with it. I'm not sure what the upper limit is. Uh, okay, I'm printing out high values. Is this gonna hit some? All right, it's gonna keep going. Maybe that's only for recursion, sorry. So let me get out of this. Stop, stop. All right. Um, let me do this quickly just because I started it. Let's just have do something that's gonna call itself. Do something. That's the example I wanted. All right, so we call do something once, it calls itself and it's gonna keep calling itself over and over again. And we're never gonna get out of it. So I do this, I'll wait 10 seconds. Um, I wish I'd comment out that code. 
anyway, the whole idea here is exponential time complexity, very bad. If you can avoid um, creating an exponential time uh, algorithm, then you'll you'll be happy because of it. All right, this is yeah, this is what I think uh, Seth was talking about. So yeah, if you keep going, um, you'll get cut off. But yeah. Um, okay, so exponential time, bad. Just staple that in your mind. But again, sometimes you can't avoid it. Again, Fibonacci, there's not necessarily a better way to do it. There might be a way to optimize it a little bit, but again, it is exponential. So just keep that in mind. All right, so this is that chart I was talking about. Um, this was taken from BigOCheatSheet.com. So let's actually check out their site. So BigOCheatSheet.com. This is kind of a cool, cool chart. Um, sheets, sheet, sheet, sheets. Sheets. There we go. Okay, so kind of a cool graph. So this kind of shows you just like the general rating for each each of the time complex we talked about. So generally speaking down here, and uh, before I go further, I should mention this is not to scale. So notice that linear is not like cutting this in half, but O of log n and O of one are considered uh, excellent algorithms as in they don't take that much time. Even as your input grows, the time that your algorithm takes is gonna be relatively quick. Um, o of n, so linear time complexity, that's in the fair range. So, you know, it's not terrible. You're probably gonna be writing a lot of stuff like, you know, if you're searching through a, a list, it's gonna be O of n. Like there's no um, general way to kind of improve upon that unless, you know, you use binary search. If your list is sorted, you know, binary search is gonna be excellent versus linear. It's okay. I mean, it's fine. It's, uh, you're gonna be writing a lot of linear time complexity algorithms, um, not, not to worry about it. Then we get to log linear. So this is the n log n. This is in that orange shaded range. That's, you know, that's not great. It's, it's kind of bad, but you know, it's not the worst that you deal with. But then you get into these, this, this category. Th these are algorithms you should avoid writing. Let me restate that. So if you code up something and you realize your time complexity is O of n squared or exponential or even worse, factorial, um, reconsider. Now, when I say reconsider, that doesn't mean you can entirely avoid it. Um, op this is where optimizations are really key. So again, you might not be able to get away from your worst case scenario of being n squared, but if you implement optimizations that can improve your average case dramatically. So again, you might not be able to refactor away from it, but you should be able to improve upon it. Um, again, n factorial, hopefully you never code something that is n factorial time complexity, um, but if you do, you might be waiting a long time, uh, depending on what your algorithm is doing. Yeah, so again, it's kind of nice to kind of see the relative um, charts of them. Again, these just go through the roof quite quickly. Um, but O of log n, anything beneath that, you know, that's acceptable, I would say. Um, this is kind of a cool site. It's definitely worth exploring. Um, again, we're going to be talking about data structures tomorrow. Um, but time complexity and data structures kind of go hand in hand. So on the site, there's a nice little table. And we talk about a whole lot of data structures. Obviously, half of these, you probably are like, I've never heard of them. That's fine. You know, we've talked about arrays. You know, those are just using lists in Python or arrays in JavaScript. We didn't choose stack earlier this week. If you remember we talking about the call stack, that's where we kind of piled on top of each other. Um, queues are first in, first out. So FIFO, um, those are queues. Again, we talked about like, if you're waiting in line at the grocery store, that's a, that's a queue. If you're first in line, you get first access to the, um, to the cashier. Uh, we briefly mentioned linked lists. Um, that's the idea of, um, again, there's no indices. They're kind of just chained uh, together. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through all these, but, um, each of these data structures have some time cost based on what you're trying to do. So arrays are excellent for accessing. So as we talked about, um, when you do something like, you know, my list or whatever data equals some stuff, um, I can index this and do data square brackets too. That's gonna immediately get me this. That's, that's constant time complexity. It knows directly what I'm referring to. It does not have to go through the other items. So arrays are great for accessing data. That's why you know, we use them often because we need to retrieve data. So I should be looking at worst case, not average case. That's the same, O of one for accessing data. But searching through it, that is linear time. So you know, if you get into a situation where you need to search for data often, you might not want to use an array. You might want to use something else. So let's take a look at, um, you know, if you're inserting data, you probably want to use a stack. So a stack is constant time because, um, you're just adding to the top. No matter what, you're always adding to the top. Um, insertion in this case for an array, I believe means in the middle, um, not at the very end. So just make sure you understand that. That's not appending, that's inserting in the middle of your data. Um, but for stacks, you insert at the same point, at the very top, same thing with a queue. So again, if you're doing something that needs to insert a lot, don't always just say array, I'm comfortable with arrays, I'm just gonna use an array. 
know what you're doing and try to pick the appropriate data structure for it. So again, tomorrow is our data structure lecture. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on data structures, but just know that there's a whole list of data structures and um, depending on what you're trying to achieve, there's generally a better and a worse data structure that you could pick. All right, so linked lists make sense, especially for insertions. They're great, but they're terrible for uh, finding items. So you gotta go through each item. But um, explore the site, kind of cool, gives you a lot of uh, information. Sorting al algorithms, if you're into sorting, uh, we've talked about bubble sort, I think. We talked about merge sort and passing, that's not on here. Um, but that's kind of cool just to see there's so many ways to sort an item. Um, again, sometimes you care about worst case. So in worst case, you might want to pick merge sort because it's worst case is better than quick sort. But, um, you know, quick sort, I think it's better than merge sort in terms of actual implementation. But again, just kind of know what you're doing and pick the right algorithm for it. I'm not going to spend too much more time on that, but cool site to, to look at there. Any questions on time complexities? What this chart is representing? Does it this make sense? Again, we're not measuring actual time; it's relative time performance based on your size of your input changing. Anker, you might get to this yet, but um, is there so far? It seems like it's been pretty straightforward to evaluate the O complexity. Um, I know we were probably using some toy examples there. You know what I mean to kind of just wrap our heads around it. Mm -hmm. But um, like for example, the Fibonacci it wasn't necessarily the implementation. It's not it, like sometimes it's an implementation that's creating the big O or the increasing your big O, but sometimes it's like the actual problem that you cannot avoid. Is that correct? 100%. And I'm so glad you brought that up because um, that is something I want to tackle here. So um, yeah, so Michael, what Michael was asking or saying is that sometimes your algorithm, just because what it's doing, it has to be big O then or like N squared or whatever. There's no way around it. Sometimes that's just the case. Other times, there are ways you can refactor the way you're doing something where you can maybe take something that's n squared and break it down into n log n, for example. So yeah, again, it just depends on the use case. Sometimes it's possible to improve upon your big O, o of n. Other times you, you can't get away from it just because you have to do all the calculations sometimes. But with that said, you can optimize and cut down on number of operations you're doing. So let's actually take an example, uh, look at an example of that since uh, Michael brought that up and definitely something I want to cover. So let's get rid of Fibonacci. We don't want to wait all, all this time for it. Um, can we get back to my example? So I'm going to do a bunch of control Z's. That's not going to be fruitful. Let's get rid of that. Um, there we go. So let's go back to an example that we tackled before. Find double. Hope you guys sort of remember this. This was our O of n squared example, right? So basically the goal of this function, I lost my data, my list. Okay, so this is my data. Uh, it's random numbers in there. So all this data. data. So this was my initial implementation. Again, as I mentioned, this is an example of n squared because we have nested for loops iterating over the same data. Again, if you have any questions about that, why this is n squared, please ask. Uh, definitely don't want to you know, speed over anything that's was anything that was unclear. But in this case, I'm going to call find double, pass in my list, and that will return some value. Results equals whatever. If you want to print the results, we could. All right, but the important thing here, this is n squared. The question is, does it have to be n squared? And the answer to that is no, we actually refactor this. So what if we did something where we create a new data structure and we do something like, um, how would we do this actually? Uh, we create a dictionary, I think. So we create a dictionary, my, let's call it double uh, dictionary. Does this need a dictionary? Sorry, I'm thinking on the spot here. Um, but basically the idea is we're gonna store double somewhere. So I'm gonna think about this as I do it. Um, instead of doing this, let's push all the doubles first. So double is gonna be, uh, we're gonna append X times two. And then I guess that we're still gonna have to go through our double array. So can we get away from N squared here is the question. One so, optimization, I don't think this gets us away from n squared, but if we push our data into a set, that would reduce duplicates. 
Yeah. And I think yeah. that would sure. help a little bit, but I don't think that, I mean, that doesn't still get away from the. You're right. Yeah. That, that wouldn't fix the main complexity. Let's create a dictionary. So let's say doubles going to be a dictionary. What are we trying to get? Okay. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to avoid having nested for loops. So in this case, I'm going to insert a value for. I know, but what's what's the end product? Like, what what's I guess the the goal of the challenge? So the goal of the challenge is we still want to do the same thing what find double was doing before, which is identifying if one item has a double of itself. Oh, okay, got it. So we're not changing the what we're trying to do. We're just trying to change the time of flex here. So what if we did um, something like this, <clears throat> and then we did uh, if sorry, I I think I picked that example. But if doubles dot y return true. So you, you might be asking, well, you're accessing something in a dictionary. Isn't that going to be linear time? Well, let's actually look at our friend over here. So we're using um, a hash table, but that is what a dictionary is. So searching in a hash table, worst case is still O of n. So I guess I didn't improve there, but Searching can be O of one. Um, yeah, so again, this gets into talking about data structures, but a hash table has better lookup times. Generally speaking, it's going to be O of one. Occasionally, if you get a lot of conflicts, you'll, you'll go back down to basically searching array. Uh, this is probably knowledge that you don't really care about, don't need to know. But in hash table lookups, generally are better. So in this case, we're still probably n squared because that's our worst case. But using a hash table here, we've improved our average case probably. Um, so again, not best example, but again, there are times where you can refactor your algorithm um, to kind of be better about it um, by your time complexity. Okay, so Anker, yes, if you had a situation where um, your algorithm was basically n squared, would it be worth it to do something like filter out everything from your data set that couldn't possibly be a double to begin with? Like odd numbers, for example. Yeah, like seven, five, and any 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 numbers in your data set that couldn't possibly be a double. Yes, but again, seven can't be a double of anything else, but we could have 14 in here. So we still need the seven in there because seven, you know, 14 is a double of seven. So we still need the seven to reference as one of the double candidates. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, again, yeah. Um, but yeah, I like the way you're thinking. Again, optimizations are um, kind of key to reducing your worst case scenario. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's move on. Let's, uh, let's, let's do a few examples. So I'm going to throw some code up on here. I'm going to ask you, maybe one of you to help me analyze it. So let's go to, let's create a new file examples.py. Of course, I mistype examples. And let's get some audience participation here. So here I have something coded up. Uh, might not be clear what's going on. Basically it's taking data. Data is going to be a list. So let's say, um, yeah, my list is going to be 1, 3, 6, 13, 4, 24, and 12. Who cares? So just random values. Um, so what example one, this function, not named the best, but it's going to compute something called a dual sum. This dual sum is going to basically sum up every x and y value and aggregate that together and keep track of that in dual sum. So basically it's going to be, you know, one plus three, that's gonna keep track of that. And then it's gonna be one plus six. So it's gonna add four plus seven. Again, kind of a weird example, but um, this is just what my algorithm is. So I'm going to look into the audience and ask, let's go with uh, Morgan Morris. Could you take a, take a guess or an analyze this and tell me what big o, o of n complexity you think this is? Am I on the uh, am I on the, the clock right now? Um, I mean, yeah, no, no rush, but just kind of take a look at this algorithm um, and try to identify what big O of n complexity you have. So I think it's n squared. Okay. Because Why? we've got the nested for loop. Okay. And so That's... for every instance of x, we are running through the entire set of uh, of data with y. Yep. Um, yeah. So Morgan is correct. So this is actually O of n squared. So Let's say O of n squared. If I could type it, O n squared, um, also known as quadratic, right? And he was right on. So in this case, we have 
uh, outer for loop going over data and the inner for loops going over the same piece of data. So basically it's N for this data N for the nested for loop and we multiply them because they're working in conjunction. That's how we get N squared complexity for this. So, yep, you are correct. Great job there, Morgan. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's go with another example. So example two, these are not well-named functions. Uh, example two, let's take a look at it. Uh, looks like we're uh, going through um, data. We're gonna find some index and we're gonna return true if the value at the index does not match the index. Again, this kind of, let's call this value. So the value does not match the index itself and X at the value is kind of a weird example. Um, Let's see. All right, yeah, don't pay attention too much to what's going on, kind of just read the code. Um, I'm trying to struggle what I was trying to do here. So the value doesn't equal the index and also the index, sorry, the value is X. What, what am I doing here? Are you just checking if the index is equal to the uh, value that it's storing or not? Or? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm actually confused what I was doing here. Sorry. Yeah, um, data is not defined. Unless... I mean, sorry, we'll be calling a function example two with my list. Um, but sorry, give me a moment. I'm trying to parse what I was trying to do here. So if data, so index at X, we're grabbing the value. So we're using a value as an index here. So if we get a value of one, we're going to use and check index three. This is a really weird example. Um, I think I screwed myself up here. So, all right, let's just go with it. Don't pay attention to what it's trying to do, but let's try to analyze the time complexity. Um, so for that, I'm going to call on, let's go with Susan, Susan Stevens, Stephen, 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 sorry. How do you pronounce your last name? That's okay. Stephen, all right. Uh, Susan, uh, could you, Help me analyze the time complexity for this, this algorithm here. Um, th this is probably wrong, but I'm gonna guess that it's linear just because you're only checking your data one time. So like worst case scenario, you have to check every value in the list. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so uh, Susan uh, said O of N, which is linear time because we have one for loop. And again, for loops are a good identifier of like a factor of N because again, worst case for a for loop is it's gonna go through your entire uh, range or your entire list. So big O of N is a good guess. Unfortunately, um, this is kind of a curveball. This is actually N squared. Now it's not obvious why this is n squared, and this is where measuring time complexity is not always trivial. Um, so again, I would agree. My initial guess would be, yeah, this is linear. We have one for loop. You know, that's done. But this is again knowing exactly what method you are using and the time complexity hit that th those offer. So dot index is a culprit here. So knowing what this is doing is important. So dot index is actually searching, um, searching through our uh, list. Now, this is some, again, this is reading documentation, just being familiar with it. This index is a linear search operation. There's no magic function that says, all right, automatically just um, tell me what's going on here. Sorry, uh, index at X, give me the value. Sorry, now this is constant time. So I don't know why my, I think I just have a bad example here. Um, I think if I did something like search, find search, the search function. Um, so sorry, this shouldn't search. So Susan, I think you're right. That was linear initially. But if I wanted to search for something um, to find a value, then that would be n squared. Sorry, my notes are off. Uh, you're saying index is constant time because it doesn't uh, have to index is a search because it's searching and then returning the index. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So it's looking for the index value. Okay. So that's what. Excuse me. So index is looking for a particular index, correct? Or there's their yeah, value. Correct. So this is, okay, I, I see that's, that's what's confusing here. So J is gonna be an index that's returned. I think that makes more sense. Okay, so sorry for all the confusion. Uh, this, is, this is my fault for sure. But index is returning 
taking in a value and returning an index to you. Sorry. So it's, it is searching through our list. Um, so we pass it a value and get back an index from it. Um, so yeah, this is a weird example still, but essentially the whole takeaway here is know what your, your functions do. So if I actually look index up, if I do Python list index method, uh, Python index list method. Um, all right, so let's actually understand what it's doing since I so clearly the index method returns the index of the specified element in the list. Okay, simple enough. Um, does it tell about time complexity? No, we could find that somewhere else. Time complexity. Anyway, the whole idea here is anytime you're calling a function, um, make sure you understand the time complexity hit. Don't just automatically assume, hey, it's a magic function. It's being constant time and I'm good to go. So there's a stack overflow question about this actually. So uh, top answer, O of N, um, check out time complexity. But yeah, it's just all ideas. Index is actually searching through your list. It's not a magic function. It just automatically gives you back a value or an index based on the value. Now, as we talked about, when you, when you do a lookup this way, so if I have my list, this lookup is constant time. So if you get, if you have an index, you get the value immediately. But if you want if you have a value, let's say I have the value of 24, I want to know what index it is. There's no instantaneous way to do it. So in this case, if I'm looking for 24, um, that's going to be a linear operation. So um, again, although this seems like it's um, constant time, this is actually linear time because this adds a factor of n. And then this function also adds a factor of n. Because searching through a list is a linear time operation. All right, so that's where we get our n times n. So this is also n squared. Okay, so a little tricky. Um, just understand anytime you call methods, that can add time and complexity for you. All right, sorry for that terrible example. I'll need to make sure I repeat that next time. Let's do one more and then we'll take a break. And uh, yeah, all right, so I have an example here. Again, nonsensical, not really uh, doing anything too meaningful. Well, let's, uh, let's call on one more audience member. Um, Let's go with uh, Tanya. Tanya, can you help me analyze the time complexity of this algorithm? And a little, little more to it, a few more lines of code, but um, take a look at it and let me know what you think. Let's see here. Um... Okay, and append is constant. Uh, so yeah, I'm just so trying to- just... Two, Yeah, so you have two for loops, but they're not nested. So it's, I don't believe that it's, um. It's O of n squared. Okay. Um, so it's for s input. You're appending the s. I'm thinking it's like a linear search. Okay. So Tanya has analyzed this and said it's O of n. So linear uh, time complexity. Um, she is correct. So I was trying to have a curveball in here, but uh, uh, I think Tanya analyzed it correctly. So let's let's talk about this. So here, this for loop is going through our input string, which does have a length. Um, so you know, longer the string is, the longer this for loop is going to take. So that's going to be a value of n. Um, but this for loop over here is totally separate. So the question is, the curveball I was trying to throw in here was, we actually do have nested for loops here. Notice we have x in data and then for y in cat. But Tanya is correct. This is actually O of n. But why is this O of n? We talked about nested for loops and that's going to be n squared. Why is this not n squared? Again, it's a, when analyzing time complexity, it's not automatic. Like you shouldn't always be like, oh, nested for loops, n squared, I'm done. Um, always think about what, how your input data size is going to impact your um, time complexity or your operation of this algorithm. So we have another for loop here that's going through data. Data correlates to the length of the string, right? We're just simply taking each character, appending that individually into data. So this is still a n hit for us. Now, this for loop is not adding any, like our input can change. This could be a million characters long. This is always going to be the same amount of time because cat is a fixed array. It only has three items. So this is always going to be three iterations, no matter what, right? So this for loop, in, like this block of code entirely, that's going to be 3n, 3n, right? But as we talked about in big O analysis, these constants don't matter. 
So yes, you know, this is going to be adding a, a multiple of three each time, but that doesn't matter in respect to our input, right? So if this is a million, um, million characters long, this for loop is not going to impact our algorithm as much. So that, that factor kind of gets moved out of it. All right, so we do have nested for loops, but again, we're not iterating over the same data. This is a fixed or constant operation. So this is still an O of N operation. This is O of N, and since they're totally separate, um, our entire algorithm is O of N. All right, so again, can get kind of tricky, um, definitely take some practice. Um, key takeaways from these examples, one, um, kind of look for those easy gimmies of like, if you have a for loop, that's generally gonna be O of N factor. If you have nested for loops, yes, generally speaking, that's gonna be um, N squared, but again, K tempted to what you're iterating over. So this were data, if I had data here, this would be N squared, because based on my input size, this will double, or I guess quadratically increase. But cat, cat is fixed. It's always gonna be three no matter what. So that doesn't impact my time plus C as much. Um, also, second takeaway, know what method you're using. Again, every method you use has a time complexity. Sometimes it's O of one, great. Sometimes it's N, sometimes it might be N squared. So always pay attention to that. Always be mindful of, okay, what is this function actually doing? How is that gonna impact my algorithm? Don't just take it for granted that everything's gonna work magically and quickly. Okay, those are our examples. Thank you to our participants. Um, hopefully that was somewhat enlightening. Um, all right, so we are approaching lunchtime. We have one more thing to get to, but I do wanna squeeze in a break. So let's take, um, let's take a seven or eight minute break. Let's take an eight minute break. Um, be back at 11.52 and we have one more thing to get through. I promise it won't take too much time. Um, and then we'll get you guys to lunch. All right, so we did some big O and Ash sys examples. Thanks for participating. Um, again, key takeaways, make sure you understand what method you're using, what time complexity hit they have, and also uh, pay attention exactly to what your, um, what your algorithm is doing. So don't always automatically jump to you know, a big O uh, analysis conclusion without uh, you know, looking at your algorithm in detail. But now it's time for our algorithm face-off. So our main event today is linear search against binary search. So these are two algorithms you've coded up and hopefully you fully understand how they're working, what they're doing. Uh, but essentially both of them are searching for an item um, in, a, in a data space. Um, in our case, we're probably searching an array, but we could do it either way. And they're gonna re return, you know, essentially the same results, but why do we have two different ways of going about it? All right, so let's actually take a look at our code. Um, so we have a couple, um, algorithms covered up here. So I have linear search, I put it into a class. So we're gonna take in data and just store that internally. When we call the find method, we're gonna search for a particular item. Um, the linear search, again, as you guys have coded this up before, is gonna simply go through the data um, via for loop. And then if it finds the item, it'll return true. Otherwise, if it doesn't find the item in our data, so it goes through the entire for loop, we're gonna return false. Now, keep, keep in mind, this is an O of N operation. Why is this O of N? Again, the worst case for this, um, for this function is that it has to go through the entire data because it might not find what it's looking for. So in this case, the worst case is gonna be O of N. You guys with me here? You guys agree or disagree? That's all correct. Right. I'm gonna take that as an agree, thank you. Um, all right, so yes, linear search is O of N. As your input size grows, so if you have 100 items, you're going to probably have to do at worst 100 iterations. But if you have a million items, your at worst cost goes up to a million iterations. It's linear, it's proportional, hence O of N, linear time complexity. All right? Uh, we also have binary search cleared up here. So I put this up. Um, there's no tricks here. Um, this is binary search. So um, yeah, so again, definitely a little more involved here. But this find actually is big O of login. Now, why is it login? It's because we keep search, cutting down our search space like by a factor of two. So we don't have to go through every item. We kind of get to kind of just smartly uh, decrease our area um, each time. So if you remember our charts, if I can pull that up, um, we're down in this range, log N, which is beneath linear time. So we're gonna be faster with our execution um, because we're smartly going through our data instead of just going through it one by one in order, right? So 
this is um, binary search. Again, you guys have coded this up, so you guys should understand kind of the, the logic going on here. But basically, we're slicing, checking a midpoint. And if we find our item, great, we return true in that we found it. Otherwise, we will recursively call our method and check the new search space. So in the case that our item that we're looking for is greater, we check the upper half. And if it's um, lower than our middle value, we check the lower half. All right. Um, so yeah, I believe this is a correct implementation. Hopefully I didn't screw anything up. We do have a special case here. So this is the thing I want to point out. Because our data is going to be sorted, notice our init method is going to sort our data. We have some advantages we can also take, uh, take advantage of. In that, since we know that we can know the endpoints, right, the start and end, if our item is less than our starting value, or if our item is greater than our last value, we automatically know it does not exist in our search rank. So that's one advantage of having sorted data. You can check the endpoints and not have to search anywhere inside of it if you to check the endpoints. So that, this is constant time operation. We're checking two values. We get these are accessible with constant time, and then we just check them. Comparing items is constant time also. So we check this ahead of time to kind of save additional work that we can avoid if we know for sure it's not going to be found. Otherwise, we get into our main algorithm, which is by fine recurse. OK, so these are our algorithms. Let's put them side by side and see what our contenders look like. All right, so here in the, in the left corner, we have linear search. Again, pretty, pretty lightweight, but you know, gets the job done. Uh, on the right side, right corner over here, we have binary search. So definitely a bit heftier. Um, but again, is there a purpose? Like why? You know, a good question. I think, uh, you know, I think John asked this question um, aptly uh, earlier saying, you know, if we can do something like this, or I think the specific example was, you know, using um, my list uh, index, which we just covered, you know, if we can use this and like, if we're looking for a value of 24, you know, we could do this in one line. Why would we even bother coding up something like this and using this? And that's a very fair question to ask, right? This gets the job done. Dot index is the same thing as linear search. So if we had a list here, um, again, I'm not going to really do anything too relevant, but you know, if you have a list of values, um, yeah, we can call we can call index on it, and this will return your actual index, which is the same thing as returning true or false. I mean, we could return the index if we really wanted to, like do i. But in this case, I just care about true and false and exists. Um, anyway, yes, this will work. This gets you results. It's one line of code. Great. Why do we bother with binary search? Great question. Let's let's find out. So I'm going to sequester each contender into their respective corners. They're gonna rest up. Now I have my runner file, which is main events.py. Um, I have some things going on here. Um, you don't have to worry about too much about the details, but essentially I'm gonna be searching um, through a search space. And so initially I'm gonna search through 10 items. So our, our initial list can be 10 items um, inside of that list. I'm going to populate my data. I'm using list comprehension, so a little more advanced Python that we went over earlier. Basically, this is going to be you know, ranging from 0 through 9 if I have 10 elements. Then I'm going to use my random uh, library and shuffle that data. So it's not going to be sorted initially. Um, again, if we were sorted initially, great. Our binary search has a greater advantage over linear search. But in this case, I'm going to shuffle that data so it's randomized. It's not going to be sort sorted. Next, I'm going to initialize some data. So I'm going to create a linear search instance called lin. I'm going to create a binary search instance called bin. They're going to take in a copy of the data. So you know we don't want to modify the original data. So we're going to copy the data list and pass them into the respective classes. And then we're going to go through and search x number of times. So in this case, I'm going to search you know 10 times. Let's make that something different. Let's search 12 times. So we're going to do 12 searches and search for a random value. So this is generating a random value. Um, it's going to find, sorry, it's kind of, kind of detailed, but my goal here is to get a random number that may or may not be in our search range. So this multiplier, 20% of the time, we're going to get a random value that is outside our, our, our list. It's not going to be inside our data. But 80% of the time, or I guess roughly 80% of the time, we're going to get a random value that does exist in our data, so we are going to find it with our algorithm. All right, and then I'm simply measuring how long each, each method takes. So starting a timer, ending a timer. Uh, I might have coded that incorrectly. Um, let me double check. Uh, no, I guess that's correct. So timer is just going to return the timestamp um, from the system clock. 
So yeah, this is just going to measure how long the linear search is going to take. I'm going to aggregate that time by subtracting the end and start times and aggregating that time. I'm going to do the same thing for binary search. So lin and bin. I have lin time and bin time. After we do all of our searches, so in this case, 12 searches, again, we can control that. Um, I'm going to print out the average time each algorithm took. So let's see how our contenders do when our data size is 10 elements. All right. So clear my terminal. Let's bring this up. All right, so let's let's run this with a value of 10. So our data data size is 10. We do Python. Hopefully I don't have any errors here. Main event. Int has no len. Great. Uh, that is random. Line 20. Int to elements. Did I do I need range there? Yes, I need range. Sorry about that. Range. So it's going to create a list here and pick a random value out of it. Okay, there we go. So we got an output here. So we ran linear search 12 times, we ran binary search 12 times for the same random value. Again, they're not looking for different values. Each time they're looking for the same value and they have the same value to start off with. So looking at this, well, okay, look at that. Linear search is actually faster than binary search. So this even furthers the point of, well, binary search is more code, right? You know, we're comparing maybe like four lines of code here versus maybe 20 lines of code here. Um, so if binary search is more code, more complex to understand and takes longer, why does it even exist? And that's again, totally fair question to ask. So this happens to be the case with 10 elements. Now, part of the reason um, is going to be because binary search needs to sort data. I guess it does it once, so that's not gonna be initially, but again, there's some overhead here to having recursive calls. Again, we have more logic to go through, right? We had to do more comparisons. That adds up. Again, it's minimal, but it does add up. Um, but if we go back to our main events, let's uh, change this to 100 items. So items to search through. So now our data size is going to be 100 elements for both linear search and binary search. All right, so let's run our new, um, our new events. All right, there we go. So we ran for 100 items. And guess what? Linear search is still faster. I mean, numbers are closer, right? In this case, the linear search was twice as fast as binary search, right? Looking at the numbers here. But now we're getting closer, but linear search still has an edge. But notice it got closer here for 100 elements. Now let's get to 1,000 elements. And now we're going to actually see some difference here. So let's run this again. Look at that. So binary search is taking a lead with 1,000 elements. Um, again, it's not super different. Like this is, you know, we're in the eighties there. We're in the four here. So that's what, 20 times. Binary search was 20 times faster for our sample. Again, we ran 12 random examples. We can maybe run more if we want to, but um, binary search by far has taken a lead with a, with a small data size of a thousand. Now you might say a thousand is a large number. Well, you know, think about the real world. Like think about your Amazons, think about your Googles. How many search, how many web pages does Google had to go through? How many products does Amazon have, right? A thousand is nothing to like really large data sets, like real world examples. So, you know, let's make this 10,000. All right, now we see like dramatically linear search is falling way behind. And that's because again, it has linear time complexity versus binary search has log n. So if you look at the curves, um, we find a better example, uh, log n curve. So this is what log n looks like. Uh, let's pull up this. All right. So can I get that? Where's that picture? All right. So this is what we're looking at. I was just wanted to get the image. Copy image. All right. This is what we're looking at. Um, I wish it was bigger. But again, as we keep going, as our end size gets larger, notice that the time starts curving. Like the curve is less. Like so we're getting less and less steep. That's well, this is what binary search is doing. So as larger end values, we get smaller and smaller hits. We're not we're not going up as fast. Linear again is a straight line. So there's some point where that line will intersect this curve, and at that point, linear search is no longer optimal or a better algorithm. All right. So that is what log n is doing. Again, this curve is staying less and less steeper. That's what binary search. That's the whole point of binary search with large data sets. Binary search is by far better. Let's get to 100,000 and run this again. All right, this is just not even a contest anymore. 
linear search on average took five milliseconds. Binary search took 0 0.01 milliseconds. All right, let's do one more example. I think you guys get the idea. Let's go for a million, which again, a million in the real world is still not you know, that dramatic of a number. Um, I bet Amazon has like tens of millions of products or transactions or whatever they're dealing with. Facebook has a billion users, right? I think just think about that scale and why um, this matters. All right, so now we're actually paused. Yeah, it took some chunk of time, 25 milliseconds on average versus again, we're still, we're, we're really growing at this point. Notice we're at 0 0.015 for, um, what was it, 100,000? And we went up to 0 0.016. So we barely are creeping up there. And linear search is just not even in the same class anymore. Okay, so again, this is why algorithmic complexity matters. This is why, again, we're doing stuff on small, small scales. So it's easy to kind of ask your question like, you know, why does it matter? Like my application runs in a snap of my fingers, I'm good with it. Well, yes, that is true for our examples, but think on a larger scale. Everything we're doing in our class, multiply by a thousand and trying to think about how your application will be impacted. All right, so again, this is our main event of binary search versus linear search. As you can see, binary search eventually is the clear winner once we get to like real large data sets. Okay, that was our coding example. Let's uh, take our key takeaways. So um, again, a lot of theory in here. Um, again, big O is definitely weird. It's kind of you know not too interesting, but I thought at a high level, whenever you encounter someone saying, oh, this algorithm is you know quadratic time or big O of n squared, just understand what they're talking about. That, that's what that's the main takeaway I want you to leave with here today. So understand that big O notation is measuring the worst case um, of a of given algorithm. And that's how software developers kind of rate algorithms and how they compare, um, you know, algorithm X, algorithm Y, all right, which one behaves better when I do, you know, inserting or, you know, removing or searching. Um, that's what big O notation is used for. Also have some familiarity with how to analyze your own code. Again, we're just starting off on it. We don't expect you to be pros, but again, identify those things we talked about. See a for loop that's adding a factor of N. If you see a nested for loop over the same data set, that's going to be n squared. Um, if you call a method, like if you call dot find in your list or dot search, again, that's going to have some overhead. Just understand that you know that you want to know at the worst case how long your algorithm will take. Look for those kind of obvious things of for loops um, to kind of help you identify what rating class you're in. Um, the last thing I ask of you guys, and I'm going to, you know, this is just a humble request. Always be mindful of writing efficient code. I'm not saying you should always be writing efficient code or just spending time on that. Again, we're at this point, we're just trying to solve algorithms, trying to be better programmers, which I understand. But as you're writing code, just be mindful of it. Think about what you're doing. Say, hey, can I improve this? If not, fine. Um, even if you're like, hey, this is a terrible algorithm. I wish I could improve it. At least you understand why it's terrible. Like if it's something that's, you know, uh, you know, two to the n or exponential time complexity, know that that's a bad algorithm. Um, again, you might have to live with it, but just be mindful of making improvements when you have time for it. And that concludes our big O um, time complexity uh, lecture. Uh, what questions do you guys have about anything we went over? Did it um, make sense? Did I lose you guys completely? That make, no, this is really interesting. Um, when talking about big O notation, um, about like an application, is it like the scope of the conversation? Is it usually around like part of an algorithm of an application? It's not like you're saying, hey, this application is like, has a big O of this. You're really talking about like a specific algorithm that's gonna be implemented. Like there could be in one application, there could be multiple different app, you know, functions that have different big O's and, or that kind of thing. It, does that question make sense or? Um... I think so. Um, let me kind of answer that with a quick coding example. So again, we always care about the worst case. So let's say we had taken in data. Let's say we're doing a for loop and we close this up quickly for X and data do something or Y and data do something, right? If we had something like this, um, this is a very simple example, but this can kind of, if you can use your imagination, imagine this is an entire application. We might have components within that. So this might be one part of it. This might be a second part of it. Together, this, this application as a whole has a complexity of n squared because this is the biggest hit, right? This contributes n, which does take some time, 
but this is not going to matter in comparison to this as our data flows. So you always take the worst of the worst. So this, in this case, this is n squared, therefore our entire application is n squared. Um, but occasionally, um, I think as Mike was asking, yeah, you might analyze only a piece of your application, right? So let's say, you know, this part of our application is uh, reading data and this part is inserting data. I, I, I don't know, it's coming up with examples. So you, you might, you know, here you might analyze like, yeah, our data reads are, ends, are, con, are linear time operation, our insertions are quadratic time. Like, yeah, you might piece it out that way because, you know, for example, you might be reading your data a lot and inserting very, very rarely. Which means again, you're still n squared, but your average case is going to be more closer to n, O of n, because you do you're doing this more in your application hypothetically, more than you're doing this. So that's how you would kind of analyze, okay, well, yes, we are n squared, but again, we're doing this like far more than we're doing this. So that impacts kind of your average case complexity. But yes, yeah, so you could do a piecemeal as in and as a part of it, as in one operation, if a user clicks a button to insert data, well, sure, then you analyze that insert is n squared. If a user clicks another button to just to read data out of your application, well, then that operation is going to be O of N. Similar to what we talked about with our fancy chart here that I still have. You know, different operations have different costs. So, you know, this, this is breaking it down into certain operations where, you know, this doesn't represent an entire application. Um, that makes sense. I don't know if that did, but hopefully that made it does, a little bit of sense. You. All right. Thank you for the question. Sorry, uh, I did just remember a question. Um, sure. So for like the Armstrong numbers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that one in, in like the first 20 million integers, there's 24 Armstrong numbers. Is it cheating to simply include the first 24 <laughs> Armstrong numbers and go, yeah, well, is it one of those? No? Okay, well then let's worry about calculating it. That, um, again, that's, that goes into optimizations. There's the idea of caching results. So yeah, if you yeah. happen to calculate them and you calculate them once, you can reuse them. So that could be a strategy again to optimize like arm numbers. I'm not sure what the complexity is of it. Probably n, uh, you know, O of n. But if you want to cut down on time, yeah, caching is a great way. Um, one of many ways to optimize code. So again, we didn't talk too much about applying optimizations, but yes, you you could do that um, if you are able to. I mean, there's no magic way to know those numbers unless you use computer at some point. But if you cache them, yes, any future applications can benefit from that. Cool. Okay. Any other yeah. questions out there? I had a question. So it seems like a lot of the uh, the significantly better uh, uh, operations, the lower uh, linear or even um, log functions require unsorted data, but the, the sorting algorithms themselves are typically pretty heavy towards the n squared front. Is, is it, I mean, how do we, I guess, how do we go about that? Is it worth ever considering to sort or is it just like if it's not already sorted just forget about it and do it a different way yeah so again this is where again it's not always yes and no it's you, you as a developer need to decide what is best for your application so yes a great point to make if we go back to our code binary search isn't magical there's some overhead to it specifically doing the sort initially has a cost to it um i don't know what sort algorithm they use but it's most likely you know one of these so it's going to take what is it it's going to take n log n to sort that data structure. That that's a hit. That's a that's above log n cost. So that is bad. Like you don't want to do that um, unless you have to. The reason binary search works in our example is because we're searching multiple times. So we sort one time, and then anytime we need to like find an item, we don't need to keep resorting it, right? So that find benefits. The more times we do that find, the more benefits we get from that one initial sort. However, if let's say our our situation for whatever example we're doing. Let's say we only need to find one number and our data is shuffled, right? It's, it's randomized. The question is, should we waste our time sorting and then doing another find, or should we just do a linear search? And at that point, linear search is probably the better option. As you saw with smaller data sets, um, it does better. And um, I guess fewer operations, I bet linear search is better also. So we cut this down to one. Um, it's probably a little better. Um, I don't know if I want to actually run this with that large, but. Um, yeah, so 10, I don't know how it behaved before. Anyway, yeah, so again, there is some overhead to binary search, so it's not always the way to go. But if you're doing multiple searches, binary search is gonna be the way to go. If you do one search, linear search might be better. So there's not always, always use binary search. Um, there are other trade-offs also. So these are things that you as developer have to factor in. Linear search, easy algorithm, easy to implement, easy to understand, doesn't bloat your code as much. 
binary search better you know, overall, but it adds more complexity. So with more code, there more bugs can creep in here, right? I could have easily miscoded something here and that's gonna waste more developer time, me going through it, understanding it, trying to fix it versus linear search, easy to maintain, easy to implement. So you, you as a developer, you are a resource also. This might take me 10 seconds to code up, binary search might take me 20 minutes, right? You, 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 your time matters also. So if, if, you, if you don't care about how long your, your application takes, just go with linear search, sure. If time is not, not, doesn't matter at all, make sure your time is used wisely too. So that, that is a factor, um, something you wanna factor in also to um, efficiency, your, your time matters. Cool. Um, okay, so I know we're into lunchtime a bit, so we'll go on key takeaways again. It's kind of um, humble request, try to understand what big O is, be mindful of efficient code, even if you're not writing efficient code at this level right now. All right, cool. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, enjoy your lunchtime. Uh, take, you know, take whatever time you need, take a full hour, but then get to your coding challenges for today. So with that in mind, let me stop the recording.